This chapter is, is titled Spontaneity, Entropy, and Free Energy. It's actually a continuation of our previous discussions on thermodynamics, which is thermo is heat, dynamics is how does it move? <clears throat> what we're going to focus on in this chapter is uh, sp spontaneity of reactions what makes a reaction go from one from reactants to products and we've talked about that in the past in terms of um, if the reactants have are um, higher energy than the products you tend to to get the reaction to go um, but we can still get reactions going uh, when the products are higher energy than the reactants so it's kind of hard to explain that with energy alone. So let's go to this um, diagram where we have, I think we've used this before, energy, and this is progress of the reaction. And in our example, we've got an exothermic reaction. We start off with energy for the reactants here. Then we have to go through a transition state where we add energy. Yeah, we did discuss this in kinetics. And then you end up with products at lower energy. But we know that the difference between this place here and this here is our enthalpy. And it's a negative enthalpy because products have less energy than the reactants and it's exothermic. When we talk about kinetics, we're dealing with this part of the diagram. This is what determines how fast the reaction goes. How much energy does it take to get over that hump? When we talk about thermodynamics, we want this part and this part. So this is thermodynamics and that side too. So what that means is we only care about where it starts and where it ends. It doesn't matter what happens in between. Uh, illustrate this point. Uh, diamond is um, kinetically stable. In other words, you got a diamond. My wife has a diamond on her uh, ring finger. And it's going to be there just like that for essentially forever, like for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Right? It's kinetically stable. It's not going to, nothing's going to happen to it in the, in a hundred lifetimes. But thermodynamically speaking, it is unstable. In other words, if you wait long enough in an oxidizing atmosphere, like, like in the air, that diamond will eventually turn into carbon dioxide. So you have two approaches there, the kinetic and the thermodynamic. The kinetic uh, discussion it, it determines, is determined by the path. In other words, if your reaction proceeds through um, without a catalyst, uh, we talked about that, without a catalyst, uh, it goes through one path, one mechanism. If it has a catalyst, then it goes through a different mechanism, which allows it to go faster. So for kinetics, this is called a path function. In other words, the path that it takes determines the outcome speed. Whereas thermodynamics is a state function. In other words, we only care about where it starts from where it ends. It doesn't matter how it got there. It's like um, uh, let's see how much energy does it take to get from Charleston to Beckley? Right. Well, your potential energy at the level of Charleston changes as you move, go up to Beckley by about a thousand feet. Uh, so you have more potential energy when you get to the to this plateau. 
How much energy does it take to get there? It depends on the path. If you take a direct route, it'll take a certain amount of energy. If you take the winding roads, it'll take probably more energy. Like if you go through, um, um, I've got the name of the town now, where WVU Tech used to be. Montgomery. Montgomery, thank you. If you go along the river to Montgomery and then back up toward Oak Hill and then back around, it'll take more energy to get to Beckley that way. But you're at the same height. So it's the difference between the path function and the state function. Thermodynamics uh, is a state discussion. Now, there are, there are certain parts of thermodynamics where we introduce a uh, path into it, but uh, in general, thermodynamics refers to uh, state functions. When we talk about spontaneous process, we mean a process uh, and it doesn't have to be chemical be physical or chemical a process that uh, proceeds without any outside intervention in other words and we know that um, uh, if our windows are not insulated which used to be common then you're going to get heat transfer in the summer you're going to get heat transfer into your house um or in the winter, you're going to lose heat to the environment. We still do that, but it's not quite as bad as it used to be. That's a spontaneous process. We always know that heat heat goes from high temperature to low temperature. <clears throat> but there are some processes that occur um, spontaneously, and we can't explain them by what we know up to this point. All right, but we're going to talk about that in just a minute. Um, let's take this as, as an example. Most chemical reactions uh, have a difference in energy of the reactants and products, right? They're very few, and I couldn't find an example. I'd looked everywhere. Find an example where the reactants and products have exactly the same energy. Right? They can be very close. So I have to use a, uh, a physical example rather than a chemical example. What if you have 2.4 moles of gas in a four liter bulb at a temperature of 32 degrees? So we got a four liter bulb, four liter bulb, and we have uh, 2.4 moles of gas in it. And this is gas. And it's at 32 degrees, All right? And it's connected through a valve to a 20 liter bulb. So we've got a valve here, and it's connected to a bigger bulb, like 20 liters. But this is a vacuum. Okay. And the temperature is constant for everything. Uh, the temperature does not change. So we can't explain anything that happens based upon a difference in temperature because the temperature is 32 degrees and it doesn't change. All right, so what happens when you open that valve? We, we intuitively, we know what happens, right? The air goes, that gas goes in there until it equilibrates. Okay, so how do you explain that? There's no driving force in terms of energy because the temperature is the constant. Right? So we need another way to explain it. And before we do that, we need to review some terms and define some terms. Um, let's start with uh, delta E. I know what delta H is first, but let's start with delta E. This is internal energy. Internal energy. Um, Sometimes in textbooks, you'll see this as U rather than E. I think they, they, they choose U because E is often used for something else. But for this discussion, we're going to say delta E is internal energy. And this is the sum total of all the energy 
in the system uh, in terms of kinetic energy and potential energy. Okay? All the energy that we can account for is this internal energy. Now for delta H, this is enthalpy. And this is uh, internal, this is uh, internal energy plus whatever work can be done. So enthalpy is going to be uh, uh, internal energy plus, um, actually it's delta P V. We only pull the we only pull P out and put the delta over here when P is constant. Maybe I better do that. Right, be consistent with the slides. So it's P delta V, and this references the work that we can do with the gas. Have we talked about that yet? We haven't done that yet. Have we? Okay, maybe that's coming in another slide. Okay, enthalpy uh, refers to the heat change in a reaction or in a process, right? Um, and this is, this is viewed in terms of potential. What's the potential heat energy available? Whereas Q is actual heat flow. So if we had a difference in temperature, we would see heat flow from the high temperature to the low temperature and we uh -huh. could measure it, okay? In fact, we did that, didn't we, with uh, calorimetry? Yeah, we did measure that. Uh, and then W is work. Right? And work is still defined as force times distance. Force applied through a distance gives you work. Also, in terms of uh, gas, changes in gas volume and uh, pressure is... P delta V is also another way to measure work. Okay, so um, now that we've defined those terms, let's see what we can do with them. All right, uh, let's look at each one of these in terms of what has just happened here. All right, let's start from the bottom. Was there any work done? There was probably a pressure change, right? We had gas confined in here, and Boyle says if if the volume increases, the pressure decreases, right? But was it working against? Was that change in pressure working against? Um, let's see. Well, now we've got I've got to look at it this way because we did change pressure, but as the pressure went down, the volume went up. So it's a wash. Nothing happened. No work was done because there was no force applied through a distance against some resistance. That's what I'm trying to say. Right? If we had an expanding gas against an external pressure, like in a, a, a piston with a cylinder, and we've got uh, maybe a kilogram weight on it, and then the gas expanded against that force, then work would be done. But in this case, no work was done. It's not working against any external forces. All right, so the work in this case is zero. How about heat flow? No. No temperature change, no heat flow. And that means with no heat flow, there's no change in enthalpy either. Did we change the internal energy? Well, if this is zero... And this is zero, right? This is zero, and that's zero, then that has to be zero. Right? So they're all zero. There's no change in any one of them. So we can't explain the process based upon what we know up to this point. Right? So we've got to, well, scientists did this. We've got to invent another way to explain it. <laughs> Uh, here's another way to explain the change in heat and change in energy. If there's no temperature change, there's been no change in energy, no change in enthalpy.
And of course, that one uh, follows from what we've already discussed. There's no work done. Okay. So what's the driving force for this process? All right. We have to come up with a new term. It's called entropy. And it's given the letter S. And usually, not usually, always, when we speak of entropy, um, we're speaking in terms of a change in entropy. What was it to begin with? What is it afterwards? This was introduced by Rudolf Clausius. See, do I have a picture of him? There he is. Looks like a happy fellow, doesn't he? No. <laughs> in, in those days, in the late 19th century, when pictures were being taken, the photographic plates were what we call, you know, the difference between slow and fast film, right? Fast film, you can you can snap a shot with just a, a very quick shutter. Slow film, you have to take in a lot of light to get the effect. Well, in the beginning of photography, those photographic plates were very, very slow. So your uh, subject had to sit there very still. And that's one explanation. The other explanation may be that uh, they didn't want anybody smiling. <laughs> or maybe he was like uh, uh, George Washington had false teeth. <laughs> but pictures that old, uh, nobody ever smiles. I've seen pictures of my grandparents. Right? Well, they're just stone cold. Anyway, that was Clausius, and he introduced this concept of entropy. Entropy, uh, one easy way to explain entropy, although it's, it's an oversimplification, is in terms of the word disorder. Now, this is not, this is not the end-all explanation for entropy, but it's a good starting place. If we look at the, uh, in terms of, uh, say, uh, uh, a room of my, my teenage son, well, he's not, not a teenager anymore, but he still has the same room habits, right? <laughs> it, when you go into his room, it looks like a tornado hit it. That would be high entropy, lots of disorder. Um, uh, if you, well, I can't use my house as an example because the whole thing is disordered. But say you went into someone who's uh, severe OCD, right? Their house is going to be extremely ordered, everything in place. Now, I will say when my son was was small, he liked matchbox cars. And he had a, he had a whole box full of them. And before he went to school, he'd get up in the morning and he'd arrange them in a certain way in front of his closet. Uh, so that was be maximum order, right? And uh, my wife, she was a lot healthier then, so she would do some housework, and she'd go into his room and uh, need to get into the closet, and she'd, she'd move his cars and do her thing, and then she'd put his cars back. So that looks like exactly the way they were. He'd come home and, said, and look at her and say, you move my cars. <laughs> he knew exactly where they were to the millimeter. <clears throat> But that would be an ordered situation where all those cars were were in was in a row. <clears throat> so when this gas expands, the driving force is an increase in entropy, an increase in disorder. That's the difference between the images. There are the molecules have much more space to move around. And that's what they want. An increase in entropy. So, in, in all spontaneous processes, there must be an increase in entropy. Um, we can speak of entropy in terms of the entire universe or in a localized uh, part of the universe. And very often, it's it's more useful to isolate a part of the universe and just say, all right, this is isolated. 
we talked about that before, didn't we? Systems that are um, isolated means uh, mass, no exchange of mass, and no exchange of energy. That's an isolated uh, system. Well, that's an isolated region of space. The system is going to be in here somewhere. Right? And then everything else is surroundings. I think we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating. And then when we discuss processes that occur, the processes are in the system and in the exchange with the surroundings. Now, if, if the system is open, that is, mass and energy can pass freely between the two. If the system is closed, then mass can't transfer, but energy can. And then, of course, isolated means nothing gets across that barrier. So when we did our calorimetry, we had our, our calorimetry cups, and we were trying to simulate an isolated system. The calorimeter cup was isolated from the outside so that everything that happened in Vegas stayed in Vegas. Okay, so if our delta S is greater than zero, which in this case it is, we see an increase in disorder. All right. Uh, the truth is, and the, the more accurate way to describe entropy is how many possible arrangements can we uh, make out of the um, elements in a system? Right? So if we have, um, say, 10, or 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10. we have 10 particles on this side, then there are a limited number of arrangements we can have in that space. But if we open the space up here, we have a lot more possible arrangements, right? We call those microstates. So the more microstates you have, the higher the entropy. <clears throat> um, and the reason we need to talk about it in those terms is if we just consider disorder, we're only discussing physical arrangement of particles, whereas disorder can also be discussed in terms of uh, increases and decreases in, in energy, arrangements of energy in a system. So we need to migrate toward microstates away from just a general topic of disorders. <clears throat> so uh, to continue with a microstate discussion, let's see, do I have any text here? Yeah, I do have some text. Each configuration that we see here gives a unique arrangement of particles. So if we have four particles in this case, and we have a, a double bulb, then one possibility is that all four particles are on one side. That's only one microstate available. And if we go the other route, if we move them all to the other side, that's only one microstate for that possibility. If we move one to one side and leave three on the other side, then we have four possibilities. Right, so we have an increase in microstates there. If we put two on the left and two on the right, then we have a total uh, number of microstates of six. And then, of course, if we if we have one on the left and three on the right, then it's the flip side of, of arrangement two, arrangement four. So we have four possible microstates. The greatest number of microstates is the one where we have two on one side and two on the other, which will be roughly discussing in terms of an equalized pressure. So we can talk about um, um, entropy in terms of positions. That is, that's the physical arrangement of particles. And here we're going to we're going to continue with this uh, disorder analogy because it's very helpful especially with positional entropy. If we look at a substance, 
say, that can be a solid. It can also be a liquid and also be a gas. And we know in order to do that, we've got to add energy. And so we are adding energy to the system. So the solid is relatively ordered. In other words, all the particles are locked in place like a sodium chloride crystal. Uh, if we heat it up high enough, we can melt it. We get liquid sodium chloride. That's, it takes a lot of energy, but we can get there. Right? That has more disorder because you have more possible microstates. In other words, they're not locked in place. All these uh, ions from sodium chloride can be in different places. So you get an increase in disorder. If we heat it further and make gaseous sodium chloride, then you have even more positional possibilities. Um, even if it's in the same volume, but it's more likely it would be in a greater volume, which would also add to the number of microstates. So as you go through phases, the gas is more disordered than the liquid and the liquid is more disordered than solid. So the entropy increases as you go from solid to liquid to gas. And that's positional probability of these states. Right? When we, when thermodynamics is discussed, it's like quantum mechanics. It's all based on probability. Right? We don't have the computing power to follow every atom or every ion in a solution or in a gas or in a liquid, whatever the case may be. We don't have the computing power or the instrumentation to, to identify where all these particles are. So we have to treat it probabil probabilistically. So it's more probable to find um, atoms or ions in a gaseous state in different microstates than it is in a liquid. Okay. We can discuss um, uh, continuing with this um, topic of, well, actually we're gonna, we're gonna migrate from uh, positional entropy, which is intuitively, it's easier to, to understand what that they're referencing. When we talk about energy entropy, and this is, a topic that's not covered in your textbook. I don't know why it's not there, but I think it's important. <clears throat> um, when we when we look at uh, increases and decreases in energy, now we have to identify. Did it happen to the system or did it happen to the surroundings? And if we have an exothermic process, then the, the system is increasing in energy. And if we have free energy transfer, right? It's not an open system, it's a closed system to mass transfer, but not to energy. So if energy increases in the system, some of it's gonna transfer as heat into the surroundings, right? So in an exothermic process, we're transferring heat, and that makes this uh, a negative value. Transferring heat from the system into the surroundings. Um, now the total, the total randomness, um, we have to look at it in terms of both positional and um, energy entropy, but we're gonna set positional aside for the moment. Because if you go from say, um, uh, let's see, hydrogen gas plus oxygen gas makes water, right? So let's see, let me balance that. That's uh, two here and two here. Well, we've got two, three, we've got three moles on this side and only two moles on that side. So for um, positional entropy, we've actually decreased going from here to here, right? from three to two, we decrease the number of particles in that space. But it's an exothermic process, so we've increased the, the uh, energy entropy. So that there has to be a, a, a balance, right? And 
this process we know is spontaneous. All you have to do is give it its initial activation energy and it'll go. I just watch this. Some of the rockets that we're putting up in the space now are based upon liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen to, to drive their engines. Now, SpaceX uses, uh, well, for their Starship, uh, they use uh, methanol, uh, methane and oxygen. And their, uh, their uh, Falcon 9s, they use uh, kerosene and oxygen. But similar concept. Anyway, we have the possibility to look at it two different ways. Um, but an exothermic process implies an increase in energy randomness for the surroundings. Because if an exothermic, you're increasing energy, it transfers to the surroundings. So that the energy entropy for the surroundings is going to increase. And the energy randomness for the... Um, well, this slide only talks about the surroundings. If this system is losing energy in the process, then its energy entropy should decrease. Right. And endothermic would just go the other direction. Okay. Um, let's work a little intuition here. Try to get a handle on this because the, the idea of entropy, um, intuition regarding entropy only goes so far. And then um, further discussion has to be the mathematical action. We're not gonna go there. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna go part of the way. We're gonna dip our toes in the water, right? but we're not, gonna, we're not gonna go full calculus on it. Okay. <clears throat> so let's see if we can predict the sign, the entropy, change in entropy for each of the following processes. Is it uh, positive increasing or is it negative decreasing? So in this situation, we have to define what is the system because that's what we're focused on. The evaporation of alcohol. So if you, if you pour some alcohol on the tabletop, what's going to happen to it? It's going to evaporate, right? So the alcohol itself is increasing its entropy as it evaporates. So we should get a, a positive value. Um, you don't have to know that stuff. This is just, uh, uh, what was it? Clausius introduced the concept and then Boltzmann actually put numbers to it. All right. So the entropy for this one is going to be positive. How about the freezing of water? It's going from a liquid to a solid. Entropy should decrease. Yeah. Mm hmm uh, compressing an ideal gas at constant temperature. Right. Yeah, it should decrease. You're giving fewer possible microstates available. Uh, heating an ideal gas at constant pressure. If you heat the gas, you're adding energy to it. And if the pressure is constant, that means the volume is going to increase. Because Charles' law says you increase the temperature you increase the volume. So we're we're actually increasing both positional and energy entropy at the same time. Uh, do you dissolve sodium chloride in water. Starts out as a solid, right? Now it's going into solution. It's got more space, more possible microstates. It should increase. Okay. So that was a little exercise in intuition. All right. Remember the, the first law of thermodynamics. Let's see. Let me put a heading up here. The first law of thermodynamics says that the total energy content of the universe is zero. In other words, you can't add energy, you can't take energy away from the entire universe. Okay. That's one way of expressing it. The second law is where we find a discussion of entropy. In a spontaneous process, there's always an increase in entropy of the universe. In other words, the change in entropy for the universe 
is always greater than zero. When you talk about the entire universe, right? when we isolate our system and surroundings, you can get a decrease in entropy, an overall decrease in entropy. But for the entire universe, entropy is always increasing. Right. So one the popular way to express that is that the universe is running down. Right. Eventually, uh, and that that fits with uh, some theoretical astrophysicists saying that the uh, the universe is going to go out with a whimper. It's just going to keep expanding until it gets uh, cold, absolute zero, and that's the end of everything. There are others that say it's going to get up, uh, expand to a certain point, and then the gravity of the universe is going to contract it. And it's going to go from a big bang to a big crunch. So who knows? Right? That's billions and billions and billions of years in the future if we make it that far. Okay. Now, what we're going to do, the textbook very often uses a subscript of universe for uh, entropy when they actually mean isolated system surroundings. Right? So I'm going to make a distinction there. If, uh, if I write a delta S with no subscript, then we're talking about this situation. Only when I write universe down here do I actually mean the entire universe. And you can also uh, subscript it with SYS for system or SUR for surroundings. Because we can talk about change in entropy for either one and how they relate to one another. <clears throat> All right. That's the first law. Total energy is increasing. So... Um, your textbook puts it this way, and I think it's better this way. The delta S total, the change in entropy for this situation is equal to the change in entropy for the, the system plus the change in entropy for the surrounding. So in this case, delta S can be negative or positive. And what we're going to find out, that may be on the next slide. Let me, let me see. What we're going to find out is that when this value is positive, then we can say whatever happens in here is spontaneous. When it's negative, it's non-spontaneous. Okay. And processes that go in one direction spontaneous are non-spontaneous in the reverse direction. Uh now, if the delta S total is zero, that means it's all at equilibrium. There's no driving force to make it go one way or the other. Now, our discussion of equilibrium also says that um, things that just that doesn't mean things are frozen in space. It just means that the rates one direction are equal to the rates the other direction. That's what equilibrium means. But in terms of entropy, Right. If we're at equilibrium, then there's no change in entropy, no matter what's going on. Is anybody confused yet? No, good. That's a good sign. Because entropy has a tendency to twist your heads around. Okay, for this process where we're going from um, something, some substance in liquid form to solid form, an increase, which direction is an increase in energy randomness or energy entropy? Let's put it up here. Let's see. We're going, something is, is going from liquid, right? Yeah. Going from liquid to solid. If we're, if we're talking about energy randomness, it takes energy to go from uh, solid to liquid. You have to put energy in. So if we're going to, actually, uh, oh, which direction involves an increase? An increase in energy entropy would be this direction, uh, energy uh, entropy would be this direction because we have to put energy into the solid to make it a liquid. 
Uh, how about an increase in positional? Well, that's the same. Positional should be the same. Right? Because we're giving it more microstates going from solid to liquid. Now, let's see if they're going to make a liar out of me. Uh, liquid to solid is exothermic, so energy randomness favors the formation of the solid, decreasing from liquid to solid. Decreases that way, so it increases the other way. Yep. Positional randomness decreases from liquid to solid, so it's uh, increase of both of them should be to the left. Now, that's a uh, qualitative description. The values that are actually assigned to the delta S, and we can put numbers to this, the values that are assigned will determine the total delta S for, for this transition. Because energy may be one, it may be a certain value this way and a, and a different value this, this way for positional. And then you have to reconcile the two. And in some systems, energy entropy increases one great way and positional entropy increases the other way. And then reconciling them determines what's the total, determines which way is favored. But in our case, they both go the same direction. So um, that's not a problem. <laughs> What's a balance between the two types? Okay. Uh, as temperature, uh, let's see, increases or decreases, which, which takes precedence? Uh, okay. As temperature increases, positional randomness dominates. So as if we take the system, um, this transitional system, and we increase the temperature, which one of these is more important. Well, as you increase the temperature, think of this in terms of percentage change. Right? As you increase the temperature, uh, a one degree change in temperature on a percentage basis makes less, it's less impact. Higher temperatures, like if we were at uh, 10 degrees, then a one degree change would be a 10% change. If we were at 100 degrees, a one degree change would only be a 1% change. Right? It's like um, if, uh, let's see, uh, you're a pauper, you make, uh, you're a poor student, you're making maybe $10,000 a year. And you're independently wealthy and you're going to school because you thought it'd be fun. Right? So you've got uh, several million dollars. And I say, okay, I'm going to give you 10 bucks. No, I'm going to give you a hundred bucks. Let's say, be generous. Give you a hundred bucks, you can right. You you lose that much out of your pocket in a day, just in change, right? I give you a hundred bucks. It has a great impact on your uh, ability to provide for you, you and your family. Right? That's the idea. So, high temperature, the energy entropy has less impact. But positional energy has a great impact because at high temperature, you've got lots of motion, lots of microstates available. Okay. So as temperature increases, positional randomness dominates. Uh, yeah. As temperature decreases, energy randomness is now favored because a change in temperature has more impact on the on the energy uh, input and release from a system. Okay. So at what temperature is there a balance between energy randomness and positional randomness? Uh, I might as well just state this as a fact at equilibrium. When you're at equilibrium, melting point or uh, boiling point uh, you have a balance between positional and energy entropy. Phase change, that's a better term. Um, 
What if we try to apply these to other things? Describe the following as spontaneous, non-spontaneous, or you can't tell. Say that a reaction is exothermic and becomes more positionally random. It's exothermic, that means it's losing energy. So it's um, energy randomness is decreasing and it's positional randomness is increasing. Uh, let me see. If it's exothermic, Um, I don't get that. At one time I did. <laughs> uh, for some reason, it's not making sense to me now. Exothermic and becomes more positionally random. So instead of our uh, hydrogen oxygen analogy, say we've got something that produces uh, more. Um, let's try something like this. Say. N2O4 gas is in equilibrium with 2NO2. So I'm not sure if this is exothermic or endothermic. It's probably endothermic. But this is gives you more positional randomness as you go from this side to this side. That would be an increase in positional randomness. But it's probably it's probably not uh, exothermic, though. So that's a bad example. Um, oh, nitroglycerin. Right. When nitroglycerin decomposes <laughs> um, spontaneously, it produces, I think we counted one time, it's like 29 moles of gas from uh, a couple of moles of nitroglycerin, right? We know that's exothermic and it's also increased positional randomness. So that's definitely spontaneous. If it's exothermic and less positionally randomness, we can't tell right? because we don't know the balance between the two. And also if it's endothermic and more positionally random, we can't tell that one either. But if it's endothermic and less positionally random, then we can say that one is not spontaneous in the forward direction. And A and D are not affected by temperature. And B and C, uh, we don't have enough information. We're going to get to a, a, a more complete discussion of this when we get to free energy. That's coming. So let's look at the uh, entropy change of the surroundings and focus, excuse me, focus on the surroundings. And that will help us draw conclusions about the system itself. If we know what's happening in the surroundings, we can imply certain things in the system. Uh, the sign of the delta S, of course, depends on the direction of heat flow. As heat leaves the system into the surroundings, then the randomness in the surroundings increases, and the process itself is exothermic. So we're transferring energy into the surroundings, making them more random. We're increasing the entropy of the surroundings. If the heat... Uh, goes from the surroundings to the system for an endothermic process, then we're decreasing the randomness of the surroundings. And the magnitude of this change is dependent upon temperature. Right? So here's where we're headed with this. The change in entropy has a greater effect on the surroundings when it starts at a lower entropy than if it starts at a greater entropy. Right? It's just a percentage comparison. So another, another way to say that is 
um, the change in entropy for the surroundings is proportional to, that's what that sign means, to the heat transferred to the value of Q, but it's inversely proportional to the value of temperature. And this uh, Q is intrinsically a change because you can't measure Q, Q unless heat has moved from high temperature to low temperature. So Q is in, intrinsically delta. But the T, of course, has to be identified as a change in temperature. So we're saying that that's what this is. Change in entropy of the surroundings is equal to, well, it's proportional to, I think we have to introduce uh, a sign change. Let's see. Yeah, we have to introduce a sign change simply because change in entropy for the surroundings is, um, well, everything's relative to the system. So if Q is, is leaving the system, it's negative. If it's entering the system, it's positive. Same for the delta uh, S. So the delta S relative to the system uh, leaving would be negative and would be positive if it's uh, increasing in the system. So if we're talking about the surroundings, we have to flip everything. Okay? Because these uh, are in terms of the system only. So we have to introduce a negative sign. And we can, um, since uh, delta S is a state function, then we can also equate it to delta H. Excuse me, yeah, delta H uh, over temperature. Actually, I didn't need that. It just depends on what the temperature is. So temperature is constant. Well, well, not constant, but it's not a change in temperature we're interested in. I'm sorry about that. We just want the temperature. And the temperature has to be in K, of course. <laughs> All right, so we have our first formula. Well, actually, we had a formula prior to that, right? Uh, total delta S total equals delta S surroundings plus delta S system. So maybe I'll write those over here. Formulas we've done so far. Delta S total equals delta S system plus delta S surroundings. Uh, in addition to the definitions. Right? Um, we haven't done this one yet. Actually, what, what is delta E? We've done this one, which is delta E uh, plus uh, P delta V. Um, we're going to get to we're going to get to that one in a minute. Uh, we just said it's of the total kinetic and potential energy, but that's that's difficult to quantify. Okay, and now we've got this one. So the delta S for the surroundings is equal to uh, negative delta H over T. Or if we measure a Q, it's negative Q over T. So those are the formulas we've gotten so far. And we're going to pick up where we left off uh, in the classroom. Now you're in my office at home. And we're going to continue. We had just established that uh, the change in entropy of the surroundings is proportional to the change in enthalpy uh, and directly proportional and inversely proportional to the temperature. So that just means that as the temperature goes up, the change in entropy of the surroundings Well, should go go down, but we've introduced a negative sign. So the negative sign is there to compensate for our um, 
convention for system and surroundings. Right? Everything is relative to the system. So if, if the entropy of the system, or the enthalpy, let's say, the enthalpy of the system uh, is negative, that is, it's exothermic, we have a negative enthalpy, then we're increasing the the energy enthalpy, the energy entropy of the surroundings. So in order to make this positive, we have to introduce that negative sign. All right. So we've got that formula available to us. And let's see. Let me try something else. Now that's better. Put this over here. Okay. Back. I think I need a better marker. So I'll just pull out a couple of them. There we go. All right. So now that we know how to calculate the entropy change of the surroundings based upon the enthalpy of the reaction that's occurring in the system, and it's also dependent upon the inverse of the temperature. Then I want to digress for a moment. Um, enthalpy and Q, heat transfer, are essentially two different concepts. They are related sometimes but they're not the same. Q is what we measure in the lab in our calorimetry experiment. Delta H is an expression of uh, heat potential for any process, right? So we're actually saying that they're completely different values. Right, enthalpy is a thermodynamic potential much like internal energy. It's a, a measure of the potential energy of the system. Uh, and it's defined by the following equation. Delta H equals the internal energy uh, plus any change of pressure times volume. And pressure times volume is an expression of, of work that's done by a gas or upon the gas. So... If we insert the equivalence of delta E, and that's one equation that I, I failed to give you earlier. Delta E can for a system can change, but it's it can only change based upon two um, measurable quantities. One is um, sorry, one is the heat change of the system. A measurable heat change of the system will change the internal energy. And the other is any work that's done by the system or any work that's done upon the system. And so heat change, if heat leaves the system, then it's negative. If, if it's added to the system, uh, it's positive. Same for work. If heat leaves this, if the work is done by the system on its surroundings, then it's negative. And if work is done on the system by the surroundings, then it's positive. Okay. So if we insert that equivalence into the equation for delta H or the enthalpy, then we get delta H equals Q plus W uh, plus any change in pressure volume. If the pressure, if the 
process takes place at constant pressure, then we can pull that uh, pressure term outside the delta. So now pressure is outside and it's not, uh, it's constant, it doesn't change. All right. Now we know that um, work, and I think this may have been done at, uh, in an earlier chapter, but it bears repeating. Um, work is an expression of pressure times a change in volume. But due to the convention, again, of um, when, when work is done by the system on its surroundings, then the work is leaving the system, so it's negative. But if we measure that in terms of pressure times volume of gas, then we get a positive value. So we have to introduce that negative sign in order to maintain the uh, the sign convention that we've adopted. Okay. Now, if we do that, if we insert that uh, minus P delta V in for W, then we get uh, overall we get um, delta H equals the equivalent of Q, which is minus P delta V, and then the uh, P delta V, let's see, um, well, I left out Q, excuse me. That's W. This is Q. E, let's see. Yeah. Oh, I, okay. I left out the other one. Uh, let me be complete. <clears throat> This is delta E um, plus uh, P delta V. Okay, so now we're going to say that this uh, delta E equals um, yeah, Q plus W. This is Q plus W. And now we're going to say that the equivalent of W is minus P delta V, right? So those are sequences of terms. And then we add the P delta V here. Notice that that one cancels that one. And in this case, a value for delta H is equal to Q. But it's only equal to Q when the pressure does not change. Okay, when pressure is constant, then a measured value of Q is equal to the enthalpy for the reaction. That's why <clears throat> um, scientists, when they conduct these types of experiments, will try to, to conduct the experiment if they're going to measure any heat transfers and try to get at a term for enthalpy, then what they'll do is try to conduct the experiment under constant pressure. That way, any measurement of Q is equal to um, a change in enthalpy. All right. So let's go to... Okay... That erase is okay, but it's certainly a chore. Pardon me for just a minute. I want to condition this board. It won't take a second.
All right. Now let's, let's get back to chemistry. <clears throat> um, I'll preface the discussion here by reminding you that the authors of the textbook, when they say Delta S universe, it's very likely that what they mean is the change in entropy for the total, that is system plus surroundings. And in our model, we isolated the system and surroundings from the rest of the universe. So bearing that in mind, uh, just do the conversion in your head. Delta S universe is Delta S total. Okay. If um, using this formula, I think it's sent. Yeah, that's okay. Using this formula, uh, Delta S total. That's messing up. Delta S total equals Delta S for the system plus Delta S for the surroundings. Okay. So in order for a process to be spontaneous, the total, or in this case, the Delta S for the universe, the Delta S for the total should be positive. Right. Then we can say that the process is spontaneous. Well, if the system is increasing in entropy and the surroundings is increasing in entropy at the same time, then the total is going to be positive. So in that case, if system and surroundings are both positive, the delta S for the total is also going to be positive, and that process is always spontaneous. And the flip side is, if this is negative, that's negative, then this has to be negative, and that's not positive in the forward direction. But in the reverse direction, it will be spontaneous. So in terms of a chemical reaction, if it's not spontaneous in the forward direction, just flip it around, it's spontaneous in the reverse direction. Now, in the situation where uh, delta S system is positive and surroundings is negative, the only time that this value is going to be positive and the process will be spontaneous is if the magnitude of this term is larger than the magnitude of that term. That makes it positive. And vice versa. All right. If this is negative and that's positive, by the same logic, the um, entropy change for the surroundings has to be more positive than the entropy change for the system is negative. In that case, it would also be spontaneous. But we don't know unless we actually have the, the values assigned to those terms. Okay. Now we're going to talk about a man by the name of Josiah Gibbs. He was an American, and he was working uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. And he was interested in determining in a process, chemical or physical, it doesn't matter, in a thermodynamic process, how much of the energy that can that is derived from that system can be used to do useful work. In other words, um, it was common knowledge that um, uh, in the heat engines of the time, um, most often uh, steam engines, <clears throat> that all of the energy that was expended in operating the engine was not converted into useful work. In fact, they were very, very inefficient. In the beginning, uh, steam engines were, you were lucky to get 1% efficiency. So if you had um, 1,000 joules uh, go through the process, you may get 10 joules of work out of it. Okay. So, um, Gibbs wanted to um, 
it was trying to determine how much of that work was theoretically possible uh, to how much of the energy was theoretically possible to extract as useful work. Okay. So he, he went, we won't go through the whole, <laughs> the whole story, but the, uh, the, the short version is he came up with this expression. This is Gibbs free energy. Free refers to energy that's available to do work. This is the maximum amount of energy extracted from a process that can do useful work. Now, it may not be all converted to useful work, but this is the maximum. And if you know the enthalpy change for a process, right, then you have to subtract uh, losses due to entropy. Okay, so that's Gibbs equation. And we're referencing here the system. We're talking about the system, not the surroundings, just the system at this point. <sighs> because there are no subscripts, then we just assume that we're talking about the system. All right. So we're going to transform this equation a little bit and try to derive some more uh, information from it. What you'll notice is these are energy terms, right? So this is going to be in joules. This is going to be in joules. This is going to be in K for temperature. That means this one has to be joules per K, right? In order for the K to cancel, this has to be the same unit overall as this one. All right, so those are the units of measure. All right, now we're going to transform this thing by, we're going to divide the whole equation through. We're going to divide the whole equation through by a minus T. So minus T, minus T, minus T. Okay? That gets rid of this minus and that minus and that T and that T. So now we have plus delta S. And over here, we have a minus delta H over T. And here we have delta G minus delta G over T. All right, we've just done some math. Okay, we know that the delta S for surroundings equals minus uh, enthalpy over temperature. All right? So this term then becomes the um, entropy of the surroundings. And of course, this term because it has no subscript, must be the entropy of the system. All right. So what is this equal to? <laughs> From a previous slide, this is equal to delta S total. So that means that this term minus delta G over T equals delta S total. Okay. What does that say about the spontaneity of the process? That says, if this is positive, the process is spontaneous. That means that if delta G is negative, then this term becomes positive, right? So if delta G is negative, the process is spontaneous because a negative times a negative is positive okay we have some an another way to determine spontaneity if we determine the free energy of the process is negative that means the process is spontaneous all right 
All right. So um, we also have to keep the temperature constant, right? Because if, if we let both of them vary, then the temperature could be, uh, could influence the outcome. So we're saying that uh, both of these are, both temperature and pressure are constant for the determination of this relationship. All right. So let's look at, well, that's not erasing as good as I thought it would. All right. So um, in this concept check, a liquid is vaporized at its boiling point, constant pressure. So we're going to predict the sign of each one of these terms. If a liquid is vaporized, we're going from uh, some liquid to some gas. It's not, it's not a chemical change, right? We're just vaporizing a liquid. It's, it's um, um, changing state. So if the liquid is the system, then is there be any work being done? Well, as the liquid vaporizes, it expands its volume, correct? If it's at constant pressure, then we have to let the volume expand in order to maintain um, the Boyle's Law relationship. So that means the gas, the vaporizing gas, the system is doing work on its surroundings. So that means W is negative. Right? Should be. Gas does work on its surroundings, so it's negative. How about the heat? Heat has to go into the system from the surroundings. So Q should be positive. All right. How about delta H? Well, if if we're in a situation of constant pressure, then del then Q and delta H are the same. So delta H is going to be positive also. Okay. How about the delta S of the system? Well, if the system is expanding, it's creating more microstates. So the delta H, the delta S for the system is positive. More disordered. So the delta S, and I won't write system here because it's understood. If you don't put a subscript, then you're talking about the system. Well, how about the delta S for the surroundings? Well, if heat is being extracted from the surroundings, then the delta S for the surrounding should be negative. All right. So the delta S for the surroundings is negative. How about delta G? Is the process spontaneous? At the boiling point, which is where we're at, constant pressure, and we're just changing phase, right? That means the temperature is constant. Delta G at equilibrium, delta G is zero, right? There's no, there's no Gibbs uh, energy change at all at equilibrium. So delta G is zero. Not positive or negative. Okay. So, if we say that delta G equals delta H minus T delta S, and this is zero, and equal to these terms, then we can solve, we just move this one over the other side, it makes it positive, delta H equals T delta S. 
at equilibrium. Right? We could solve this for other terms. Right? We could say uh, delta S for the system. So delta S for the system then is equal to delta H over T. And that's positive. Okay? At equilibrium. So all we had to do is change the sign from our previous formula. Delta S for the surroundings is minus delta H over T. But at equilibrium, delta S for the system is positive delta H divided by T. Okay. Um, the value of delta H for vaporization of a substance is uh, 45.7 kilojoules per mole. And its normal boiling point is 72.5 degrees C. Calculate the delta S for the system, delta S for the surroundings, and delta G for the vaporization of one mole of this substance at 72.5. So if we're vaporizing it, that means uh, delta G has to be zero, right? There, I mean, at equilibrium, the free energy is zero, okay? We know that the surroundings then is minus delta H over T. And the, by convention, delta S is in terms of joules, um, uh, joules per K. Oops, sorry. Joules per K, and this is per mole also. Um, so we have to convert kilojoules to joules, right? We can't compare apples and oranges. So it all has to be converted to joules. And that's why we have 45.7 times 10 to the third. And then we have to convert the temperature to K. So we do that. And we multiply those together. And we get minus 132 joules per K mole is the delta S for the surroundings. And since we're at equilibrium, then the Delta S for the system is just equal to the sign change for that value. Professor Dave here. Let's learn the laws of thermodynamics. He knows a lot about the science stuff. Professor Dave explains. The laws of thermodynamics help us understand why energy flows in certain directions and in certain ways. A lot of the concepts described by thermodynamics seem like common sense but there is a layer of math beneath the intuitive level that makes them very powerful at describing systems and making predictions. We won't get into the math, but we should be able to describe these laws conceptually. The first law, described in the most basic way, highlights conservation of energy. Energy is not created or destroyed, it only changes forms, from potential energy to kinetic energy to heat energy, etc. While we have found this to be untrue on the quantum level, for chemists, it does just fine. However, there seems to be a preferred direction in which energy flows from one form to another. In order to understand why, we look at the second law. The second law introduces a new concept, entropy. Entropy is quite difficult to understand, but we can most easily describe entropy as disorder. And the second law states that the sum of the entropies of a system and its surroundings must always increase. In other words, the entropy or the disorder of the universe is always increasing. Within a system, there is also a tendency to go towards higher entropy. The classic analogy is that your bedroom will over time become messy, but it won't suddenly become neat. Another way to look at this is to say that entropy is a measure of how dispersed the energy of the system is amongst the ways that system can contain energy. Yet another way is to analogize entropic states to computer code. Let's take for example an ionic solid compared to the same substance as a liquid. Clearly the solid state is more ordered and the liquid state is more disordered or higher in entropy. To describe the solid state using computer code, you would need to include terms that describe the geometry of the lattice, the intermolecular distances, the precise configuration of every molecule, and many other things. But to describe the liquid state, 
you would need to simply describe the volume of liquid and the shape of the vessel because the motion and configuration of the molecules are random. That's far less information that needs encoding, which is a way of rationalizing why increasing the entropy of a system is thermodynamically favorable. We can look at all kinds of processes to highlight entropic influence. Heat will flow from a hot coffee cup into the table or your hand because the heat energy will be more disordered if more dispersed. This is why heat spontaneously flows from hot to cold and not the other way around. Entropy. The third law states that a perfectly crystalline solid at absolute zero has an entropy of zero, as this is the most ordered state the substance can be in. Entropy is measured in joules per Kelvin. Note that entropy is not a measure of energy itself, but of how energy is distributed within a system. It is enthalpy, the thermodynamic quantity we learned about before, that is more accurately describing the energy of a system. As we will see, enthalpy and entropy intricately relate to tell us something about the Gibbs free energy of a system. G, or Gibbs free energy, tells us whether a process will be spontaneous or not, meaning if it will simply happen on its own. Change in Gibbs free energy is given by this equation, which includes change in enthalpy, change in entropy, and temperature. If delta G is negative, the process is spontaneous. If positive, it is non-spontaneous. So we can use this equation to see how a spontaneous process can be either enthalpically or entropically favorable, or both, but not neither. For example, if delta H is negative, which means exothermic and energetically favorable, and delta S is positive, which means an increase in entropy, which is also favorable, a negative minus a positive will always be negative, or spontaneous. If the opposite is true, and both are unfavorable, we have a positive minus a negative, which will always be positive, or non-spontaneous. If only one of the two is favorable, we have to do some math. If delta H is positive, or endothermic, that energetic unfavorability could be outweighed by the other term if the process is entropically favorable. And since T is here, this factor will increase with a larger T, so entropically favorable processes are more likely to be spontaneous at higher temperatures. Conversely, if it is energetically favorable but entropically unfavorable, the entropic unfavorability will be minimized at lower temperatures. This is a very important equation to understand, because it describes all of the spontaneous processes in the universe. There are those who incorrectly use entropy and the second law of thermodynamics to imply that order can't happen spontaneously. But we just showed that entropically unfavorable processes can be spontaneous at lower temperatures if they are energetically favorable. An example of this is soap. You need soap to wash non-polar dirt and grime off your hands because they are immiscible with polar water molecules. But soap molecules have polar heads and long non-polar tails, which allows them to spontaneously form structures called micelles. These are spheres where the soap molecules orient themselves with the polar heads facing out in order to maximize ion-dipole interactions with water molecules that bring the system to a lower energy, and the nonpolar tails will all face in, trapping the dirt by making a network of van der Waals interactions. The dirt trapped in the micelles washes away because the micelle as a whole is water-soluble due to the polar heads facing out. That's how soap works. And that's also how highly ordered structures can form spontaneously if by enthalpically favorable or energy storing processes. In this way, systems can defy entropy on the small scale, but the second law does hold true in that the entropy of the universe is always increasing. Let's check comprehension.
Thanks for watching, guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com. Okay. Professor Dave gave you a pretty good synopsis of entropy, free energy, and, and spontaneity and reactions. This is uh, this slide is just a summary of uh, what he was talking about. So if you <clears throat> uh, if you look at the two terms, the delta H versus the minus T delta S. and you're trying to figure out if the process is spontaneous, then what you need is for these two terms to add together to make a negative delta G. So that means um, if the delta H, the enthalpy is negative or exothermic, and the delta S is positive, for the, for the system, then both of them are negative, and it's always going to be a negative delta G, always spontaneous. No matter what the temperature is, doesn't matter. If this is negative, uh, excuse me, if this is positive, then you're always going to get a negative term there. Um, if you're, if this is positive, then that gives you a, a negative term but if this is um, positive, if they're both positive, then this temperature must be high enough to, to make this term larger than that term. Because if this is positive, that has to be sufficiently negative to overcome the positive and give you a negative here. So you have to have high temperatures if both these terms, both that one and that one, are positive. If they're both negative, then you have to, this one has to be a low temperature. In other words, you have to minimize the positive outcome for this one. Because if that's negative times a negative, you get a positive. So if this, if it's very low temperature and this is a negative, if it's in uh, exothermic, then you get a spontaneous reaction only at low temperatures. But if this one's negative, giving you a positive term, and this one's positive, endothermic, then it doesn't matter what the temperature is. It's always non-spontaneous. All right. Um, so let's say, let's take this hypothetical. Gas A sub 2. A sub 2. So that means it's two atoms bound together, right? That's what we mean by that. So A sub 2 uh, reacts with gas B sub 2, right? To produce gas AB, right? So to balance it, we need two of these, don't we? Right? So now we're balanced. And if the temperature is constant, right, constant temperature, temperature doesn't change, and the pressure doesn't change, and constant pressure, okay, those are stipulations. The bond energy of AB is much greater than that for either reactant. So this bond energy here, is greater than this one or this one. So what does that mean? What does the what what does it mean the bond energy is greater? What it means is it takes more energy to break that bond than it does to, to break this one or to break that one. 
That's what that means. So you have to put more energy in to break that bond. Okay? All right. So we're going to try to predict the signs of the delta H uh, and the delta S's. Uh, and that's what this red lettering means. More energy is required to break AB than either A, uh, AA or BB. Therefore, more energy must be supplied to break AB bond, and it is at a lower energy state than either AA or BB. Okay, now we'll go to the next slide. I think we'll go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, remember when we were calculating enthalpies of reactions, all we needed to do was to, to sum all the energies required to, um, to break the bonds and subtract the energies released when the bonds formed. All right, so uh, energy required to break the bonds, that is for to break these bonds here. And then how much energy do you get back? Right. So we're going to get more energy back than we put in. That's what this is saying. All right. <clears throat> so if the energy of the reactants, uh, it <coughs> excuse me, is greater than the energy of the products, we have an exothermic process. All right. And if you look at it this way, um, if we draw our energy diagram, then we have something like this. Right, these are the reactants and these are the products. So we put a certain amount of energy in to break the bonds, and then we get a whole lot of energy out because the bond is stronger. That's an exothermic process. So the delta H has to be negative. How about the delta S uh, for the surroundings? Well, let's see. Delta S for the surroundings is based upon the, the delta H. So if the delta H is negative, the delta S for the surroundings must be positive. All right? Because there's a negative delta H. How about the delta S for the system? Well, um, we can't tell for sure. We're assuming that the delta S for the system is essentially zero. Uh, but we don't know for sure. It depends on other conditions. Uh, we're going to, for the time being, we're going to argue that delta S for the system is zero. The, the system didn't change in, in um, entropy. And if all of this is part of the system, then we've got one mole, one mole, and two moles. So we have two moles here, and we have two moles here. So that's, that's one of the reasons that we're saying delta S for the system didn't change, because all of this is represented in the system. And if we have two moles here and two moles there, we have the same number, uh, the, the same order, magnitude of order. So that's one of the reasons we're saying that delta S for the system is zero. So how about the delta S for the total? Well, if you add the two together, the delta S for the total is, Z, is positive. So this should be a spontaneous process. All right. Now, if we want to say something about, about the uh, third law of thermodynamics, it's not going to be extremely significant for us. But here it is. The third law of thermodynamics simply establishes at what point is entropy zero. Entropy is assumed to be zero. That is, there are no microstates available. For a perfect crystal at absolute zero. That's, uh, in other words, we're establishing a reference point. So if we say that, that, that means that at any temperature above zero, there is going to be 
an entropy value for anything. All right. So uh, entropy, uh, this little zero means standard conditions. Right. Uh, for one mole, one atmosphere pressure, um, uh, 25 degrees Celsius, which would be 298 degrees Kelvin, under standard conditions. All right. Um, so this represents the increase in entropy that occurs when a substance is heated to those conditions. So if this react, the, if we want to know the entropy for the reaction, what we need to know is the total entropy for the products minus the entropy for the reactants. This is reminiscent of a calculation of enthalpy. We could calculate the enthalpy for a reaction if we know the enthalpy change for the the products minus the enthalpy change for the reactants, we can find the enthalpy change for the reaction. And we can do a similar calculation for uh, entropy. The difference is that every reactant, every product has a positive value, has a value, excuse me, has a value for entropy because uh, they're all warmer than zero K. Whereas with enthalpy, we had a zero point. And some things were given a value of zero just by convention. But entropy is not that way. Every substance has an entropy value. Um, uh, this is just a, a blanket statement. Uh, delta S generally increases as the complexity of the molecule increases. So if you larger molecules are going to have higher entropy than uh, simpler molecules. This is an illustration based upon water. So if we compare water to diatomic hydrogen, these are the things that water molecules can do. We can have a symmetrical stretch of the bonds between oxygen and hydrogen, right? We can have a, uh, let's see, what would you call that? We can have a, uh, an, uh, an angular change, right? It can swing in and swing out. We can have an asymmetrical vibration, right, like this one. Or the whole molecule can rotate. Those are the possibilities for water. So we have four possibilities for water. But when we talk about uh, modes for hydrogen, hydrogen can only do two things. It can stretch its bond or it can rotate. That's it. So the simpler molecule, the dihydrogen, has a lower entropy value than water does. And we see that here. Uh, let's see, entropy. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, water has more possible microstates. So a standard entropy for water should be higher. Oh, but water is a liquid. Excuse me. Okay. <laughs> If water were a gas, like hydrogen's a gas, the value would be larger. But since water in this case is a liquid, its entropy is going to be less than hydrogen as a gas. All right, so we can't compare that previous slide to this slide it, it, uh, because of the phase change. Okay, getting back to our discussion. If we want to calculate the uh, entropy change for this reaction, where sodium solid is reacted with water to make sodium hydroxide and hydrogen gas, then all we need to do is add up the product entropies, right? Two times 50 is 100, right? So two times 50, two moles times 50 joules per k mole. 
and then hydrogen, which is 131, 131, and then subtract uh, two sodiums, and sodium would be 51, and then two waters, which was 70, I think, right? Like that. Okay, so what do we get for our answer? We get minus 11 joules per K. That's our entropy change for this reaction. And notice that every term, every reactant, every product has a value of entropy because none of them are at zero K. None of them are perfect crystals at zero K, so they all have values. Okay, we can do a similar calculation for free energy because we can, we can have a value of free energy for each of the reactants and products in a, in a reaction, and all we have to do to calculate it is uh, take the free energies for the products and subtract the free energies for the reactants. Right. All right, let's take this hypothetical situation. Okay, keep that on screen. We have a stable diatomic molecule that spontaneously forms from its atoms. So if it spontaneously forms from its atoms, like that, then what do these values mean? Well, what about the entropy? We've gone from 2 to 1. So delta S should be negative, right? Delta S is negative because you go from two atoms to one molecule, right? You've decreased your randomness, your number of microstates. The term spontaneous means that delta G has to be negative, right? So what about delta S? Uh, Delta H. Well, this is at a lower energy state than this than these two, because when you come together and form the bond, energy is released. That's always the case. Energy is released, which means that delta H is negative. Okay. Now that was a hypothetical. Let's look at a, a real example. We have phosphorus trichloride, right? And this is a gas plus chlorine gas is in equilibrium with PCL5 gas. Okay? And the delta G, let's see, delta G zero equals negative. 92.5 kilojoules, 92.5 kilojoules, kilojoules, there we go. Okay, that's given, that's all given information. What will happen to the ratio of partial pressures of PCL5 to the partial pressure of PCL3 if the temperature is raised? Okay, that sounds like, you know, we don't have enough information. But the partial pressure we're looking for is the ratio is the partial pressure of PCL5, PCL5, to the partial pressure of PCL3, right? If the temperature is, is raised, so we're going to increase the temperature, and what happens to that value? All right, uh, let's see. Okay, there is an explanation. <clears throat> Delta S is negative. We're going from one mole, two moles, to one mole. 
So delta S is negative. Okay? And the temperature, change of temperature is positive. We're increasing temperature. <laughs> but the reaction is spontaneous, right? Because of that negative. So delta G is negative. Okay? Delta H must be negative, exothermic. Because delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. This one's negative. Um, well, temperature change, yeah, temperature change is positive. This one's negative. This is a positive, right? So those two together are negative times a negative. That makes a positive, right? Negative times a negative is a positive. So in order for this to be negative, delta H must be negative. It has to be exothermic. There's no two ways about it. This has to be exothermic. So, as the temperature is increased, the reaction proceeds to the left, right? If it's exothermic, that means our delta H term is over here, right? It's on the product side. So, if we increase the temperature, we're adding to that term. That means we're moving back this way. That is, this is decreasing and that's increasing. as the temperature is increased. So the ratio of the two will decrease. Right? That explains the ratio is decreasing. All right. Uh, now, up to this point, we've talked about delta G zero under standard conditions. But what about delta G under non-standard conditions? All right. Uh, I'm going to have to erase this stuff. Okay. Let's see, keep it on screen. Delta G under non-standard conditions is related to delta G under standard conditions, but we have to introduce this factor, RT log partial pressure. Large, uh, yeah, pressure. Um, it can also be written natural log of Q. So if you have a reaction in which you can calculate the Q with its um, uh, concentrations of reactants and products, we know how to calculate that. Um, equilibrium. It's not an equilibrium constant, but it's calculated the same way. And R has to be the, uh, the uh, gas constant with energy term in it, 8.3145. All right. Uh, okay, so hold on to that. I'm going to leave it up here because we're probably going to need it again. But we're going to talk about delta G for chemical reactions now. Um, a system can achieve the lowest possible free energy by going to equilibrium. Not necessarily by going to completion. Now, it's possible to go to completion. Um, for instance, uh, in a phase change. In a phase change, you go from A to B, and that's it. But in a chemical reaction, you can go somewhere in between, where you have some uh, products and some reactants left at the, at the same time in the system. And that's um, 
a lowest possible free energy state is, in this case, it would be at C for the chemical reaction. The equilibrium point occurs at the lowest value of free energy available to the reaction system. And that would be equal to zero. So delta G at equilibrium is zero. So that means that uh, delta G here is at, at equilibrium, delta G is actually zero. Not the, the standard conditions, but the actual conditions. So that would be zero is equal to delta G zero plus RT. Now we're not, we're not log Q anymore because Q is not equilibrium. K is equilibrium. Right. Our equilibrium constant. <clears throat> so if we solve for, if we solve for delta G uh, zero under standard conditions at equilibrium, then we get, uh, excuse me, a negative RT log K. So now we have a way to uh, calculate K uh, using delta G zero, or we can calculate delta G zero if we know what K is. So if we run a reaction and determine what the K is for that reaction, and we've done that before, then we can calculate what delta G zero is. Okay, this one's a little hard to follow. I'll, I'll admit, these, this slide set is difficult to follow. I'm going to do my best. Um, if we have... Um, if we're talking about a system where A reacts to produce B, Okay, this process goes from, let's see, I'm going to have to erase this. Sorry. If we're going from um, uh, a gas, A, to B, okay? At some point, we're going to reach equilibrium, where you have some A and some B. Now, they, they don't have to be equal, but remember, equilibrium is a, a rate situation. In other words, the forward rate equals the reverse rate. And that occurs at some concentration for A and some concentration for B. In this case, we're saying that the um, free energy on the y-axis is high in the beginning and then the as the a begins to react we get down to um a place where uh 75 percent of a has reacted well we're going to produce what's left over we're going to produce some b right and the fraction of a that's reacted uh tells us where that equilibrium occurs. So if we react all of the A, then we're not at equilibrium anymore. So the delta G goes up. So when you get to the, the far right panel, if you go to 100% or all of the A is reacted, then your delta G is going to be uh, higher. It's going to be uh, greater than zero. Um, and if you don't react enough, you're also going to be greater than zero. But that equilibrium point occurs when you've reacted just the right amount of A to produce some B, and then you have the equal rates. So if we use the previous equation and we say that um, the free energy of A equals the, the standard free energy of A plus RT log uh, partial pressure of A, and we can do the same thing for B and produce an equation for B based upon the partial pressure of B because we're dealing with gases, so we're going to use pressures. Then the total uh, free energy of the two is 
the free energy of A plus the free energy of B. So as A disappears, the free energy of A decreases, and the partial pressure of A also is decreasing. Right? So we get that equation where we are decreasing the free energy of A, and since the partial pressure of B is increasing until we reach equilibrium, then as long as the free energy of B is less than the free energy of A, the reaction will proceed to the right. right? But when the free energies of both of them are now equal, they're at that low point in the graph, then the total uh, free energies is equal to A plus B, and the change in free energy is products minus reactants equals zero. We're at equilibrium now. All right. What can we say about free energy and the relationship of the uh, standard free energy to K? Well, if K equals 1, we have uh, roughly a balance between reactants and products. It won't be exactly one with every reaction, but uh, close enough. At that point, we have equilibrium and delta G0 uh, equals zero. Well, actually, um, we're, we're at equilibrium anyway. Excuse me. Let me back up. We're at equilibrium. If we if we're saying the K value is a certain value, then we're at equilibrium, and delta G zero equals minus R T log K. So if K equals one, then what does that reaction look like? Right. Delta G zero equals minus RT log K. If K equals one, remember what logs mean. This is base E. So what power of E is equal to one? Zero. Right? That term right there, if this is one, that term is zero. So delta G has to be zero. All right? If K is greater than one, Right? If K is greater than 1, right? K is greater than 1, then the log value is going to be positive, right? And that makes a negative term. Now this term is negative. So if K is greater than 1, we have a delta G0 that's less than 0 or negative which means the reaction is spontaneous. So whenever K is greater than one or much larger than one, we expect the reaction to be spontaneous and vice versa. If K is less than one, then we, we say that the reaction is not spontaneous because Delta G zero then would have to be positive. All right. And we're coming down to the wire. <clears throat> so the maximum, uh, according to Josiah Gibbs, the maximum amount of work that can be extracted from a process is equal to the free energy. That was his premise. That's the maximum amount of useful work that can be extracted from a process. So work maximum is equal to delta G. That's not delta G zero, it's delta G. Um, the only time that we can, and that there are reasons for this that we can't go into here, but the only time that you can expect this relationship to be true, this, this maximum work to be actually extracted from a process is when the process is reversible. When you can move back and forth between going this direction and that direction easily. The fact of the matter is, 
all real processes are irreversible. In other words, they go one way and they stay there. That means that the maximum work obtained from delta G is not obtainable. You'll never get there, right? It, it's an ideal. But it, it gives you a, it gives you a, 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 a relative position for all the other processes that can occur for this, um, all the other um, states or conditions that can be assigned to a given process. We know we'll never reach it, but we can, uh, it's our goal. We can get close to it sometimes. So what's the temperature dependence of K? Um, the, we've already shown from our, um, our uh, slide set that the equilibrium point occurs at the lowest value of free energy available to the system. Right? That's equilibrium. And delta G, the actual delta G, is equal to zero under those conditions. So uh, there again, delta G zero, standard conditions, equals minus RT log K. Okay. Now, uh, delta G is equal to minus RT log K, but it's also equal to delta H zero minus T delta S. So we can equate the two equations that are that are both equal to delta G zero, right? If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. So if we divide that equation through by minus RT, we get log K and, and we cancel and combine, we get log K equals minus delta H zero. Um, yeah, divided by R times one over T. Okay, plus delta S zero divided by R. Okay, does that look familiar? Y equals M X plus B. If we run an experiment and we relate the uh, standard enthalpies and the standard entropies to K's for reactions under different conditions, right, the temperature changes, we let the temperature change. Actually, we determine K for different temperatures. That's what we're doing. So we've got a, a data set over here where we have K determined for different temperatures, right? We have values here, values here. So we take the inverse of that T, one over T. Now we have a different data set, right? This is X and this is Y. Actually, log K is Y. Then if we plot those two, then the slope of that line is equal to the enthalpy divided by R. It's a negative slope. And the y-intercept is the delta S standard conditions divided by R. So I think the next slide is going to show us some real data. Notice on the x-axis we have 1 over t, and the unit of measure is 1 over k, or k to the minus 1. And then the, the log k is on the y-axis. If we plot that data and we get the regression line, the best fit line for that data, then this term right here, the slope, is the negative delta H over R. Right? All we have to do is set that equal to minus delta H over R and solve for delta H, and we can find out what delta H is. And then we look at the intercept here, right, 24.924, which is delta S over R. And we can gain a lot of information simply by doing just a few experiments and calculating the K at different temperatures. Uh, maximum work can only be attained 
by hypothetical pathway. Every real pathway wastes energy. Because all real processes are irreversible. So this is another way of, of expressing each of the laws. <laughs> the first law of thermodynamics says you can't win. Right? You can never win. Right? The first law says uh, energy is constant. Energy change in the universe is constant. Right? You can't gain energy. You can't lose energy. So we're saying you can't win. You can only break even, right? Because it doesn't change. You can't get more energy out of a system than you put in, right? Second law comes along and says, all right, you can't even break even because you're going to lose something with entropy because in the universe, entropy is always increasing. Anytime you transfer energy from one place to another, you waste energy <coughs> unless... Uh, one side of the movement of that energy is at absolute zero, and that never happens. Not even in outer space. What's the what's the base temperature for outer space? It's about four K. That's known as the background radiation for the for the uh, universe. So you're never going to reach. You're never going to have. Uh, a perfect transfer of energy. You always lose some to entropy. So that means uh, you can't win. You can only break even for the first law, but you can't even break even for the second law. And then the third law says you can't get out of the game because you can never achieve absolute zero. Right. So it, it's a no-win proposition. <laughs> that the sum of all we've discussed simply says that every time we use energy, we degrade it. In other words, it becomes less useful.